Okay, so praise God, brothers and sisters. Uh, this, this whole module on the Holy Spirit, this is what we have been learning. The first teaching you heard was on the person of the Holy Spirit. The second one was on the what the Holy Spirit can do for us. And today we are going to be discovering that we are his workmanship. We are the workmanship of the Holy Spirit. And we are going to find out and we are going to discover how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Okay, so I will get in, get into the teaching straight away. And our key scripture, our key scripture for this evening is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Okay, there are three parts to the scripture. The first part says that we are God's masterpiece. The second part says he created us anew in Christ Jesus. And the third part tells us why God made us new creations. The new purpose of the new creation is so that we can do the good things God planned for us long ago. Okay? So, this is our key scripture. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Okay. So, who are we, brothers and sisters? We are God's workmanship. That's what that's what the scripture emphasizes. It says that we are the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is taking each one of us and, and, uh, and recreating every one of us into the image and likeness of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is constantly working in our lives. As That's why it's so important for us to surrender to the Holy Spirit. That's why we keep saying, Holy Spirit, take control of my life. Because unless we surrender... The Holy Spirit will not be able to work in our lives. Against our will, he cannot work. Okay? So that's why we surrender willingly to the work of the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? We said he's creating us anew in Christ Jesus. This has already happened in baptism. Okay? In baptism, we have already been recreated. Our spirit has been regenerated. We've experienced new birth in the spirit. Okay? But the Holy Spirit is not only concerned about our spirit, he's also concerned about our soul and our body, which still need transformation. Okay? So that is why the Holy Spirit's work in our life is ongoing. And even our spirit, which is recreated, needs to be strengthened. That needs to be edified. That's why the Holy Spirit is constantly concerned about our spirit and our soul and our body. And that is what he's working every moment in our life. He's working out this transformation, this work of recreation. So why is he working in us? We remember that so that he can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Brothers and sisters, before the creation of the universe, God already had a plan for us, a beautiful, perfect plan for us. So very often when we look at our lives, things are definitely not going according to the plan of God. So how do we get God's plan to be worked out in our life? We give our lives to Jesus. We surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and yield to the working of the Holy Spirit. And then... God can do what he originally intended so that he can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. We believe in predestination because God has a preordained plan for us. That is why we are called to yield continually to the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you and I, brothers and sisters, as Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, we are work in progress. The Holy Spirit is still working on us, still transforming us, each one of us, okay? And this, this is what the Holy Spirit calls us, even, even while the work is still going on. He looks at us and says, you are my masterpiece. That's how much he loves us. 
and he takes pride in what he's doing in our lives. He calls us his own handiwork. He takes responsibility for this, for his part in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual maturity. The Holy Spirit is a master craftsman. The Holy Spirit is the one who's constantly working on us. I think I, most of us will remember that, that beautiful song, no? He's still working on me to make me out to be. That's what it means. And when, when I started yielding and surrendering to the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, one day I just, I just heard the Holy Spirit say, you are my trophy. And, and I, I was so thrilled at the word that the Holy Spirit used. You know, it says, you are my trophy. What do we do with a trophy, brothers and sisters? I'm sure we've all, all watched tennis on uh, TV and all the Grand Slams. And when the, when the, when the winner lifts up the trophy, what a moment of pride, what a moment of joy, a sense of achievement. And they, they treasure that trophy for which they have worked so hard, hours and hours of sleeplessness and, uh, and exercise, building up their bodies so that they can win this coveted prize. And the Holy Spirit looks at you and me as his trophy. And that is what he's making of us. Perfect, beautiful, recreated in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we are work in progress. Not finished as yet. Okay? But the Holy Spirit is patiently working on us as we yield to him. Okay? So this is what the Holy Spirit does. As the dawn of creation, the Holy Spirit brought the world to life. So also the Holy Spirit is recreating you and me. And he's not going to give up. He's not going to give in until he's finished his work in us. All that we need to do is constantly yield to the Spirit. Okay? So Jesus' one-stop solution was the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. When Jesus, when Jesus had to go, had to leave the world, he said, don't worry. I had to go, but the Holy Spirit is coming. And he knew that the Holy Spirit is going to handle everything. The Holy Spirit is going to take care of whatever was left, whatever was undone, and whatever needed to be done in the lives of his apostles and his disciples. Okay? So when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, what is important is that we need to surrender. That, that is why praying in tongues is so important because praying in tongues is surrendering prayer itself to the Holy Spirit. You're saying, okay, I'm not going to put my mind and my limitations with the language that I know. I'm not going to limit prayer. I'm going to yield to the Spirit so totally. I'm going to surrender so completely that I will also surrender praying to the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will pray the perfect prayer for me. So when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit starts His work of sanctification and empowerment in us. Okay, so there are two. Uh, there's a twofold ministry of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. Please remember these words. The Holy Spirit is always sanctifying us and the Holy Spirit is always empowering us. Okay? This is ongoing. All the time, the Holy Spirit is doing this, these things so that we can be recreated in Christ Jesus. The final product has to be another Christ here on earth. And who is that other Christ? You and me. As the Holy Spirit works in us, we will be continually sanctified, continually empowered. And there, that is how we will be recreated in Christ Jesus to be another Jesus here on earth. Okay? So the end result, the end result is we will be not just like the physical Jesus who was here on earth before the resurrection. We will be like the risen Jesus. Remember, the risen Jesus had no limitations. He could pass through walls. He knew what they were speaking, even when he was not there. He knew what Thomas was saying. I want to put my finger in the wounds. I want to put my hand in his side. He knew it even though he was not physically present because he was already in the spirit. So you and I, when we yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will ensure 
that we become like the risen Jesus. The same qualities, the same abilities of the risen Christ will start manifesting in us. That's what 1 John chapter 4, verse 70. I just love this verse. I love this verse. I look at Jesus and say, as Jesus is, so am I in this world. Jesus is in a place where there's no sickness. Therefore, there's no sickness in my body. Jesus is, is in a place where there are no limitations. Therefore, nothing will be a limitation for me. Because that is who the Holy Spirit is making me. He's making me as Jesus is here and now in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Nothing, nothing can touch us. No, no demon, no evil spirit, no demonic affliction or possession or oppression. No sin, nothing. We, can, we are not bound, brothers and sisters, unless we ourselves yield to it. So if we are continually yielded to the Holy Spirit, our life will be just like Jesus, as he is now. Remember, because that is where you and I are in the spirit, okay? So you and I are work in progress. And what does this mean? The final product, the final product is what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 tells us. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the Holy Spirit is working on each one of us to bring us to a level of maturity that our faith may be of the same level. Unity of the faith, that we truly, perfectly understand what God's word says, live by his word, stand on his promises, live the life of faith, where miracles and signs and wonders are like normal for us. That is the level of faith, like Jesus, okay? Look at Jesus' life and say, okay, that is, that is the final product. That is the end result. Okay? And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Okay? We're not just called to the faith, a faith level of Jesus. We are also called to a perfect knowledge of Jesus. That we know him personally. I know the known. Whenever the scriptures use the word knowledge, it means an experiential knowledge where we can say, yes, I know him because I have experienced him. He's alive in me. So when, when it says knowledge, think of it not as head knowledge. It's always an experiential knowledge. That is what will set you apart. There are plenty of people who have a lot of knowledge. But we are not talking about knowledge of Jesus. We are talking about experiential knowledge of Jesus. And that is what the Holy Spirit wants us to experience. And to mature manhood. Brothers and sisters, most Christians, if you look at the level of their faith, of their spirituality, it is like babies. Now we have plenty of spiritual babies. But our calling is to rise to maturity in Christ. Just like Jesus. The level of maturity that we are supposed to walk in is like Jesus. And that is what the Holy Spirit wants for us. He doesn't want us to be infants, spiritual infants. They're no use. They're no use to God. God cannot entrust us with, with divine realities and divine verities that he wants to give to us unless we allow the spirit to help us to grow to maturity. And what level? And what is the level, brothers and sisters? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look forward to this, brothers and sisters. That is what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. And he's not going to settle. He's not going to settle for half-baked half -baked Christians. He wants us perfected in Christ Jesus. So that the world looks at us and says, hey, this person is different. They're not like us. Their life resembles Christ. They're not human in so many ways. They forgive like him. They love like him. They work miracles like him. That is what is going to set you and me apart, brothers and sisters, when the fullness of Christ is made manifest in us. And that's what the Holy Spirit is eager to do in our lives. So his work is ongoing. Remember that. And the purpose of his work, as I mentioned earlier, is that we do the good works, is unto good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when we look at the word good works, we think, Oh, works of mercy, helping the poor, 
uh, building hospitals, building schools for the for the uneducated and this and that. Actually, no. When you look at scripture, and when you see the word good works, it usually refers to the works of God. Okay? And if you don't know what the works of God are, look at the life of Jesus. Doing what God does. Here on earth, you and I are called to do what God originally intended for us. When the apostles were sent on the day of Pentecost, they started living just like Jesus. Miracles started happening in their hands and the Holy Spirit was guiding them. And that is, that is a life which resembles the life of Christ. I know works of mercy are good, are important, but they're not more important than preaching the good news, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, driving out demons, brothers and sisters. The world needs this today more than ever. The gospel has to be proclaimed with miracles and signs and wonders. And that is what the Holy Spirit wants. That is what the Holy Spirit is looking for from the church today. For lives which resemble Jesus' life and the works which resemble Jesus' work. So you and I are challenged today by the Holy Spirit to yield to him so that he can do what he wants from our life. Okay? Yes. So who determines how long this process will take, brothers and sisters? Okay, like this whole process of becoming mature in Christ, attaining to the level of faith of Jesus and the fullness of the knowledge of the Son of God so that the, that the fullness of Christ is made manifest in us. Who determines how long this process will take? Who do you think determines this, brothers and sisters? Do you think it is the Holy Spirit? I'm sorry, it's not. It is you. You determine how long this process will take, depending on how you yield to the Holy Spirit. So many Christians are just stagnant. And I don't believe there is a, there is a place called, you know, stagnant. Usually they're sliding back and they don't even know it. They're not progressing. They're not moving forward. They're not moving upward in their knowledge of God, in their maturity level, in their knowledge of God's word, in their experience of the power of God in their life. So they are actually moving backward, but they're so unaware that they think, ah, oh, we are in a, in a nice place, in a comfortable place in our relationship with God. That is not where God wants us, brothers and sisters. That is a place where the enemy can easily attack us if we're not moving forward, if we're not continuously making progress. Therefore, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as you allow the Holy Spirit, depending on how much you allow, only that much the Holy Spirit can do. Therefore, this whole process depends on you and me. What we, just the extent to which we yield to the Spirit, that much the Holy Spirit can work in our life. So the more you yield, the joys, the more the Holy Spirit can do in your life. The less you give up yourself to the Holy Spirit, the less the Holy Spirit can do in your life. There's such wonderful things the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us. But are we ready? Are we eager? Are we willing? Say yes to the Lord now. And he'll do wonderful things. So this session, we're just going to quickly run through the points that Colin covered in the first teaching on the person of the Holy Spirit. And also run through the work of the Holy Spirit very quickly, very briefly. And how the Holy Spirit works in our life. Okay, what is his modus operandi? How does he work? What is his mode of operation? How does he do the things that he wants to do in us? So when we recognize, okay, yes, this is how the Holy Spirit works. When I pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit works. When I study the word of God, the Holy Spirit is recreating, transforming my mind. So that is one of the methods. This is, these are the means that the Holy Spirit uses to work in our life. So it's very important for us, brothers and sisters, to be aware of this so that we can yield to the Spirit. And that's why we need to constantly be aware of the twofold ministry of the Holy Spirit, which I mentioned a little while ago. It is ongoing sanctification and how he does it, okay? How the Holy Spirit sanctifies us continuously and ongoing empowerment. Empowerment is another two-step two, uh, two, uh, uh, procedure. 
Okay, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And remember, it's all ongoing. He's constantly restoring us and he's constantly equipping us. Okay, don't think of it, okay, oh, so many big words, so many words. I'll explain during the course of the teaching. That's what I'm going to explain, okay? The Holy Spirit, as he's empowering us, he's empowering us by restoring us and empowering us by equipping us, okay? These are the two things he's doing. And how you and I can activate the power of the Spirit in our lives, okay? I'm sure you already are aware of it because we activate the power of the Holy Spirit mainly, primarily by praying continuously in time, okay? So this is what we're going to be studying today. So the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our counselor, he's our helper, he's our paraclete. The paraclete means our advocate. He's another advocate. Jesus says, I will give you another advocate. So who's the first advocate? Jesus. Who's the second advocate? The Holy Spirit. So how many advocates do we have? Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Two persons of the Trinity are our advocate. They are our lawyers fighting for us. Okay? He's our strengthener and our enabler. We can, because we have the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, we should always be saying things like what St. Paul said in Philippians 4.13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what if it is something new, some new challenge, something I've never done before? Nothing is too difficult because the Holy Spirit is my strengthener. He is my enabler. He's my enabler. What? I don't even know if there's a word like enabler. But the Holy Spirit told me, I'm your enabler. I'm the one who enables you to do whatever you need to do. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Whatever you need to do, he will enable you. He will enable you to love even in the most difficult situation. He will enable you to forgive even the person who has hurt us so many times. Like in today's, today's gospel reading, St. Uh, Saint Peter is asking, asking Jesus, how many times should I forgive? He's probably like, oh Lord, I'm fed up of forgiving. That person is hurting me over and over and over and over again. What is Jesus saying? 70 times 7. Why does Jesus challenge us with, with such things? Why does Jesus say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who persecute you? Why is he saying these things? Because he wants to make us miserable? No, because he knows that it's possible in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the more we yield to the Holy Spirit, he will enable us to love in every situation. To forgive in, under any condition. Whatever we need to do, brothers and sisters, we can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then the Holy Spirit will be our, is continuously our wisdom. So there's nothing lacking in us. It's not about qualifications. It's not about education. It's about our yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. His wisdom is available to us. So he will guide us. As Jesus said, he'll guide us into all truth. So nothing, nothing, he will, he, will, he will lay bare everything for us. No mysteries. There'll be nothing mysterious. God's plan and desire is to reveal everything to us. He doesn't keep secrets from his friends. We don't keep secrets from our best friends. And God, Jesus says, I don't call you servants. I call you my best friends. So you and I, brothers and sisters, as we walk in the spirit, we will experience that level of revelation where the Holy Spirit will keep revealing. There'll be no mysteries for you anymore. That's the kind of intimacy you and I can walk in when we walk with the Spirit. And he's our teacher. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Whatever you need to be taught. And he will remind you. And he will remind you of anything you have forgotten. Especially the Word of God. In any situation, if you are going through any confusion and anxiety, the Spirit of God will bring the Word of God alive to us. He will teach, he will remind. Okay? And he is the lover of our souls, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit is the love of God. So as we yield to the Holy Spirit, we'll be filled with more and more love. That is how we can love others. The way God loves us. And he is the potter. We are the clay. He will melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Make, he will make another Jesus out of us. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our lives. As we yield to him. See what this says about the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5 verse 5. 
and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has come in, overflowing the hearts by the spirit of holiness who has been given to us all. Who has been given to us, brothers and sisters? The love of God through the Holy Spirit. The spirit of holiness is the love of God. The Holy Spirit is a person and that person is the love of the Father and the Son. Okay? Yes, that is that is like, you know, not totally, uh, you know, uh, easy to fathom. Father, Son and Spirit and the Spirit is called the love of the Father and the Son. Okay? So he is the love which unites the Father and the Son. And that is the love God has poured into our hearts. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the love of God. That is why so many people, when they experience this, uh, the, when they are praying in tongues for the first time, they are awakening the love of God. And what are they experiencing? They are experiencing love. They are experiencing joy and peace. And they are weeping because they say, I never felt so loved in my life. That is who the Holy Spirit is, brothers and sisters. He's the love of the Father and the Son. That is why the Holy Spirit can satisfy. Even when no human love can ever satisfy us, the love of God can satisfy. That is why the Holy Spirit is the one who satisfies. He is the embrace, the tender kiss of the Father and the Son. As you pray more and more in tongues, brothers and sisters, you will just experience more and more of the love of God. You will stop complaining, oh, my husband doesn't love me. My wife doesn't care for me. My children ignore me. They don't call me. They don't remember me. My friends have forgotten me. I've done so much for them. They don't keep a track. But you are keeping a track. You should not keep a track. If you've done something good for others, don't remember it. Let them remember it. That is why, that is why, without the love of the Holy Spirit satisfying us, we will constantly be complaining, oh, this one is not loving me, that one is not loving me. Receive the love of God, brothers and sisters, as you let the Holy Spirit love you. You will not crave love anymore. In fact, you will have so much love to give, you will say, okay, you want love, I will love you. You want love, I will love you. And that love will enable you to reach out to the sick, you will heal the sick. To those who are in pain, you will comfort them. That is the kind of love. God's love goes out. It's not like, oh, I'm loved, I'm loved. It's the love which reaches out to others. That's the love of the Holy Spirit. And it's unspeakable joy. You will never be going through depression and sadness because joy of the Lord will be your strength. Constantly, the joy of the Lord will energize you. And cause you to just reach out, reach out to others who are in need. He's endless hope. You will never be in despair. COVID comes, plague comes, whatever comes, economic distress, depression, this, that. Nothing will touch you. Nothing will touch your mind. Because the Holy Spirit is the source of your hope. And he's everlasting peace. Anything disturbs you, remind yourself. The God of peace is within me and his peace will guard my heart and mind. So if you constantly come back to that place of rest, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is within me. I love the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves me. Your peace will come back to you. Your joy will come back to you. Your hope will come back to you. And you will live in the love of God. And in the will of God, and the plans of God, and the purposes of God for you. Okay? That's why, brothers and sisters, I love this saying. I don't know who said it. It says, our pursuit of the Holy Spirit should never be about seeking an experience, but about a relationship. It should not be just about a good feeling. Oh, I was, I, I had goosebumps. Oh, I experienced such warmth. Oh, I experienced a cool breeze. Oh, I felt like water was flowing out of me. That is not the purpose. That's not the end of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, intimacy with the Holy Spirit is a true purpose. That's what it's about. That's what it should be. It should not just be for an external experience or even a good feeling. It should be about an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we need to stay connected with the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a choice you and I need to make. 
That is why Colin taught us that beautiful prayer to help us to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I like to just uh, emphasize, you know, what I heard one day, you know, you know, the meaning of the word intimacy. It means into me see. Keep looking into the heart of God. Keep looking into the love of God. Keep remain intimate with the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. That is what is going to help you in every, every struggle in your life that you will ever face. If you remain connected with the Holy Spirit, that's why this beautiful prayer that the Holy Spirit taught Colin to teach others. Holy Spirit, I love you. Holy Spirit, be my helper. Holy Spirit, take control of my life. Keep saying this throughout the day. Throughout the day, connect with the Holy Spirit. And keep praying in tongues. You will walk at a different level, brothers and sisters, very soon. That maturity that you seek in Christ, that, that joy, that peace, that purpose, you will find it as you stay connected with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So yield to the Holy Spirit. Because that's when the Holy Spirit can work in your life. Just constantly yield to the Holy Spirit. And then as you yield to the Holy Spirit, he will be empowering you. Okay, remember I told you there are two things. He will be empowering us and he will be sanctifying us. So this empowering that the Holy Spirit does, again, I said it's twofold. It is a restoration and an equipping. Okay, he will restore us and he will keep on equipping us. Okay, so how does the Holy Spirit actually restore us? So what is that restoration that needs to happen? Okay, it's not just a restoration of our fortunes. Even that will be restored. Things that you have lost in life. Your wealth has been destroyed. Your health has been destroyed. Your relationships have been affected because of sin, because of Satan. You may be experiencing so much of, you know, destruction in your life. Even that the Holy Spirit will restore. But first and foremost, the Holy Spirit will restore us in our identity. Romans 8.15. Learn the scripture, brothers and sisters. It says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you will, so that you will live in fear again. Brothers and sisters, there are only two ways that you can relate with God. Either as a son and daughter of God or as a slave. It's the mentality. It's the mentality I'm talking about. And that is what the Holy Spirit is also trying to transform in us. He empowers us by giving us the right understanding of who we are. So if you don't understand that you are a son of God, that you are a daughter of God, you will relate with God as if you are a slave. Your mentality will be of a slave or a servant. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to change in us. I've heard so many people praying to God, saying, Lord, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. Why? Why do you have to beg God who has given everything? He's given us his son. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And in Jesus and in the Spirit, he's given us everything. And you are sitting and begging God? It's because you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. You think you're a slave. You think you have to win favor with God. You are already favored. In Christ Jesus, all of God's goodness, favor, mercy, grace, Sufficiency. Everything has been poured into us, brothers and sisters. Therefore, remember, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to transform in us, the way we relate with God. He says, you have not received the spirit that makes you slaves so that you live in fear. You and I don't need to fear God. We don't need to fear the devil. We don't need to fear anything because we are sons and daughters of God. Rather, the spirit you've received, you have already received. Remember, in the baptism, you've already received the spirit. You've already received, has brought about your adoption to sonship and daughter. So what does it mean? The Holy Spirit whom we have within us has made us sons and daughters of God. Brothers and sisters, if we only understood what it means to be a son of God, to be a daughter of God, everything would change for us, brothers. Everything would change for us. Because then we would know that almighty, eternal God who created the 
whole universe is my daddy, is my Abba. I can just run into his arms anytime. Because that's that is why it was so scandalous for, for the Jews of his time. When Jesus said, Abba, Father, God is Father, God is my Father, God is your Father. They crucified him for that. But Jesus did not change that fact. He did not say, oh, okay, okay, he's like a father. He's like a father. No, he is father. That's what Jesus said. And he was willing to pay for that truth with his life. Because he said, that is the truth that will set you free. You will know this truth and the truth will set you free. The truth is about our identity, brothers and sisters. Who we are in Christ. And by this Holy Spirit, it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can come to an awareness of what it means to be a son and daughter of God. And what it means to cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, my daddy, my father. When you walk in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you'll walk in a new level of intimacy with the Father. There will be no barriers between you and the Father. You know the Father just loves you. Even when you, if, if ever you sin, you fall, you fail, get up, say, I'm sorry, run back into his arms. You will have that freedom because you realize you're a son and daughter of God. And that happens through the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. Not everyone walks in this kind of intimacy with God. Not everyone. It is those who know that the Holy Spirit is within them. And the Holy Spirit empowers us by giving us this knowledge, by giving us this experiential knowledge of being a son and daughter of God. That is a privilege. Okay? So as, as we grow in this knowledge and this awareness of who we are, you know, who we are, yes, I'm a son and daughter of God, this is what the knowledge does to us. It, it gives us, the Holy Spirit gives us knowledge of who we are, whose we are, where we are, what we have, what we can do in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we'll quickly run through these points of who we are, whose we are, Answer these questions. Answer these questions to be yourself. Who we are? Sons and daughters of God. Whose we are? We belong to God. We belong to Jesus. Where we are, we will discover. Maybe you'll say, oh, I'm, I'm in my house. I'm in Bombay. I'm, in, uh, I'm in, uh, in Dubai. You need to know where you really are, brothers and sisters. What we have, and what we can do. Okay, so we'll quickly run through this. We just went through this point. We're heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. So as a son and daughter of God, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So whatever the inheritance, we're talking about inheritance. When we talk about being an heir, we're talking about the inheritance. What do we have? We have everything that belongs to our father. That is what we own because our identity has been restored. When we say yes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit restores us in our identity as the sons and daughters of God. And as sons and daughters of God, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and we are kings and queens in Christ Jesus. That is who you are. That is who we are, brothers and sisters. We are called to rule. We are called to reign. We are called to have authority. We are called to have dominion. So as you walk in the Holy Spirit, you will discover who you really are. This is what the Holy Spirit does. By the Holy Spirit, we walk in our true identity. Dominion which was lost because of Adam's sin has been restored to us by the passion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. What Adam lost in the Garden of Eden was restored to us when we said yes and received the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus paid the price, he won it back, and he gives it to us. So now we are recreated in the new Adam, who is Jesus. Therefore, we can take authority in Jesus' name. That is how demons will submit to you. Situations and circumstances will align with God's will for your life when you do it in the name of Jesus because you know who you are. And you know, you start walking in your rights, in your privilege as a son and daughter of God. If you don't know your rights and privileges as a citizen of the country, anyone can take advantage of you. And if you don't know your rights and privileges as a citizen of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, as a son and daughter of God, the devil will destroy you, brothers and sisters, because of your lack of knowledge. 
and situations and circumstances will overwhelm you. So when you start walking in awareness of who you are in Christ, your rights, your privileges, you cannot be taken for granted. So whose we are? Whose are we? Who owns us? Who do we belong to? Romans 8 verse 9. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So what does St. Paul say? In reverse, we who have the spirit of Christ, we belong to Christ. How often you find people saying, I feel like an orphan. I have no one. And what they're saying is, you know, there's no one I can, I can say that that person belongs to me. Tell them the good news. Receive Jesus into your life. Receive Jesus into your heart. Then you will belong to Jesus. And Jesus will belong to you. That is, that is the joy of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, it says here, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we can say that we belong to Jesus. Only through the Holy Spirit. So we belong to him as he has purchased us. He has bought us. He has paid the price for you and me. By his precious blood, he, has, he owns us. St. Paul says we are slaves of righteousness. And he belongs to us. As we belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to us. So that's who we are. So where is Jesus now, brothers and sisters? Before we go into where we are, where is Jesus now? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 20, 20 to 22 says, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Okay? This is talking about what God accomplished when he raised Jesus from the dead and made him sit at his right hand. We know Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above rule and authority, power and dominion. Okay? Just, just picture this, brothers and sisters. Jesus on the throne and a there's nothing above him. Everything is beneath him. Jesus is above rule and authority, power, dominion, and above every name that is named. That is why Jesus' name is the name which is above every name. Okay? So that's what this word is telling us. And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. It is for now and forever. For now and forever, there's never going to be a name which is above, above the name of Jesus. And he has put all things under Jesus' feet and made him head over all things. Okay, so Jesus is above everything. Everything is underneath. Yeah. He has put all things under his feet for the church, which is his body. So it's not just about Jesus. Jesus is Included his body with him, that is you and me, the church. So Jesus is above all, and you and I too, brothers and sisters, as the church, as the body of Christ, we too are above all. That is what it says. When you wonder now, where are we? I'm not talking about your physical body, where you are, where you're sitting now. Where are you, brothers and sisters? Ephesians 2 verse 6 tells us, and he raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you and I are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. We have a dual citizenship through the Holy Spirit. We are on earth, in the flesh, in our body, but in the spirit we are, yes, in our body too. But in the spirit we are also seated in heavenly places. That's what the word of God says. That is how, that is how when we connect with God, we're connecting with him at a different level because we are with him. He's brought us on the same level with him through the Holy Spirit in a place of authority. So everything is underneath Jesus' feet. Therefore, it's underneath your feet. Therefore, it's underneath my feet. So where are we now? We are in a place of authority in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, okay? So what do we have, brothers and sisters? By the Holy Spirit, we have power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have the same power that Jesus had. Because Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that is the power Jesus has given us when we 
received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So what do we have? What did Jesus have? Acts 10 38 says, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay? In the same way, and, and, and what did Jesus do? He went about doing good and delivering all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus went about doing good because the Holy Spirit was within, was within him. And we too, brothers and sisters, have the same power of the Holy Spirit for the same purpose. So that you and I can be Jesus here on earth. Going around, doing good and delivering all that were oppressed of the devil. All that are oppressed of the devil. The sick, the, 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 the sinful, the helpless, the hopeless. We have power to reach out to them and deliver them. Just like Jesus. Okay? So what do we have? We have this immeasurable power in us who believe. Ephesians 1.19. And what is this immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe? Brothers and sisters, we have power. But we need to believe that we have power. We have authority, but we need to know what it means to be in authority, to be a person of authority in the kingdom of God. It's not presidents and prime ministers who are important. It is sons and daughters of God who are walking in power, who are walking in authority that are important. We are the ones calling the shots. And if we don't know that we have the power in us, we will not use that power, brothers and sisters. Remember, God has empowered us so that we can make a difference in this world according to the working of his great might that is the power of the holy spirit his great might is working in us so as we yield to the spirit we will walk in the same power and what can we do we need we are, we are, the holy spirit will tell us what we can do he tell us as jesus said in john 14 verse 12 he says truly truly i say to you he who believes in me will also do the works that i do you want to know what you'll do, brothers and sisters? If you believe in Jesus, if you yield to the Spirit of God, you will do the same works that Jesus does. Jesus does. And greater. And Jesus says you'll do greater works than these. Because I go to the Father. Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father. And that means the Holy Spirit is coming into you. If I, go, if I don't go, he cannot come. So it's better for you that I go. So that the Holy Spirit can come. Jesus had to prepare the way for the Holy Spirit to come. Because Jesus wants us. He needs us to do the greater works. Greater than he did. Greater than he did. If I go to the Father, I will send him to you. Because Jesus knows, without the Holy Spirit, our lives will be useless. And he says, unless I go, he cannot come. Therefore, I'm going. And he's come. And he's in you to empower you and equip you for greater works. Okay? And we have been recreated in Christ Jesus, brothers and sisters, and constantly the Holy Spirit is equipping us. Remember I said empowering and equipping. Those are the two things the Holy Spirit keeps on doing along with sanctification. Alright? So how is he equipping us? He's equipping us with gifts and charisms to minister with power. We're not helpless. We're not left to our own devices. Oh, how can I help this world? How can I help this sick person? No, we have the Holy Spirit who's given us whatever we need. All the gifts are available to us. Remember, I think most of you attended the Gift of Tongues workshop. We listed. We listed the charisms there. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4. It says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Holy Spirit. So the same Spirit is the one who's giving us all these gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9, we classify them into different gifts. They're called the word gifts, they're power gifts, they're revelation gifts. Tongues, interpretation, prophecy. The power gifts are faith, healing, miracles. Revelation gifts are word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discernment of spirit. All these gifts are activated in us, brothers and sisters, when we pray in tongues. That is why we are encouraging you, we are pushing you. Pray in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in tongues. Because the power of the Holy Spirit will be unleashed in your life. And you will start living like Jesus in this world. Apart from the empowering and equipping, the Holy Spirit is continuously sanctifying us. 
Remember the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May the God of peace himself sanctify you. Who's the God of peace? The Holy Spirit. Who's going to sanctify you? The Holy Spirit. May the God of peace sanctify you. Entirely, every part of you, spirit, soul, and body. Remember, you are a spirit being. You have a soul. You live in a body. And every part of us needs to be sanctified. That is why the Holy Spirit has been given to us. He's the Holy Spirit. He will make us holy. And he will present us sound and blameless. When? He will finish his work in us, brothers and sisters. Don't worry. The Holy Spirit will never leave, leave us, you know, incomplete. In the day of our Lord Jesus, he will present us holy and blameless. Spirit, soul, and body. Because he who has called us is faithful. He will do it. He will do it as you yield to the Holy Spirit. What is our, our role? What is our part? We have to keep yielding to the Holy Spirit. Then our spirit and soul and body will be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So how is the Holy Spirit sanctifying us? By the word of God. What did Jesus say? In John 15 verse 3. You are already made clean by the word I have spoken to you. Brothers and sisters, cleansing happens. Renewal of the mind is happening when we study the word of God. You have already been made clean by the word I have spoken to you. Jesus' word is cleansing, has sanctifying power. It can transform our mind. It can renew our understanding. So as we yield to the and, and what is Jesus saying? It's not the full Bible Jesus is talking about. Huh, brothers and sisters, mind you. Jesus is saying you are already made clean by the word I have spoken to you. Therefore, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are not on par, brothers and sisters. The New Testament, Jesus says, is spirit and life. Because they are the words of the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. And when he speaks, he's speaking at a different level. And that is why Jesus is saying, you're way clean by the word I have spoken to you. Get more of the New Testament into you. It will renew your mind and cleanse you from the inside. John 17, verse 17. See what Jesus is saying. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word, who's the word? The word is Jesus. Jesus is saying, sanctify them. Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer to the Father. And asking Father, Father, sanctify them, sanctify my, my, my disciples, sanctify my, uh, my chosen ones in the truth. The truth of God's word sanctifies us. Yield to the word of God, brothers and sisters. Yield to the sanctification of the word. That is why, that is when your mind will get renewed. Romans 12, verse 2. Verse two Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What is the kind of transformation the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit transforms us by renewing our mind so that we may prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Without the renewal of the mind, brothers and sisters, we cannot prove to the world what the will of God is. Neither the good will, nor the acceptable, nor the perfect will. We cannot prove the will of God unless we know what the will of God is. So you and I need to yield our mind to the, to the cleansing power of the word of God. The Holy Spirit will take the word. The word is the sword of the spirit. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 6 verse, verse 17, it says the, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. So who's, who's taking that sword? The Holy Spirit is taking the sword. And he's piercing through the depths of our being. Piercing through our mind purifying our thoughts, purifying our understanding of things. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. Transforming us. Then we will know the will of God. In any situation, when bad things happen, we will not be saying, oh, this is the will of God. What can we do? The God, God this was, this just happened. If it happens, it doesn't mean it's the will of God. Okay, please realize that. Everything that happens on earth is not the will of God. Everything that happens in heaven is the will of God. That is why it is heaven. And this is earth. It's not yet been transformed. It's not the new earth any, yet. It is not the new, new heaven and new earth. It's not yet come. But when we yield to the Holy Spirit, 
we will begin to understand the will of God as our mind is renewed to the truth of God's word. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Brothers and sisters, where is the word of God supposed to be? Under your pillow? On your table? In your pocket? On your phone? No. The book of the law shall not depart, depart from your mouth. It has to be in our mouth all the time. And we shall meditate on it. Meditate means it should be in your mind. Day and night. In your mouth, in your mind, that you may be careful to do. How will you start doing the word of God? How will you start obeying the will of God? Only when you're just constantly, you know, you're meditating on the word, you're speaking out the word according to all that is written in it. Then you shall make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Your life will be fruitful. You'll be prosperous. You'll be successful when you meditate on the word and do the word. And the word is constantly coming out of your mouth. We need to have our brains rewired with the word of God, brothers and sisters. Meditate, meditate, meditate on the word. It means to fill your mind with the word of God. All the time, think of the word. Dwell on the word. Memorize the word. Find your own good, wonderful ways of memorizing the word of God. Because the more the word is in you, the more you get the mind of Christ. Say the word. Mutter it softly. Say it loudly. Shout the word. That is how the mind gets renewed with the word of God. Claim the word. Claim the promises of God. Confess the word. And you mute your mics, please. Prove the word of God. It is for us to prove. God's promises are there. How are they going to come to pass in the world? You and I have to prove the word is true by showing the word that, that the word of God can come to pass through our lives. Stand on the word. Align your life with the word of God and do the word of God, brothers and sisters. Don't be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Okay? And then the Holy Spirit wants to sanctify us Sanctify our, sanctify our body, our flesh. What does St. Paul say? Galatians 5.16, he says, I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When we continuously yield to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome sin, we will not go by the flesh. We will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Pray in tongues. As you pray in tongues, you will sin less and less. Your flesh will become stronger in that sense. You will not be weak in your flesh, falling repeatedly, but you become strong. Your body will get disciplined. And fasting also helps. Fasting helps to overcome the sins of the flesh. And, and, and if the Holy Spirit inspires you, fast for your own sanctification. The spirit is constantly a battle between the spirit and the flesh or the carnal nature. Or the natural man. The word of God also says. So as you yield to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will strengthen your spirit. And the spirit will overcome the flesh. The spirit will defeat the flesh. And all the fruit of the spirit will start manifesting in you. Love and joy and peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And sin will reduce in your life. Pride and greed and lust and selfishness. Self-righteousness. Anxiety, jealousy, envy, all this will reduce and the nature of God will increase. That is sanctification. And you will start doing the works of God, brothers and sisters. You will start manifesting all the works in your life that Jesus himself did. Exactly what Jesus did in any situation. In John 15, 5 verse 17, Jesus says, My father is, still, is working still and I'm working. How are they working? Through you and me. God is working through us. We are his have earthly headquarters. God lives in us, works in us, works from home. God is always working from home, from within us. So what is Jesus' work? Basically, it was teaching and preaching, healings and deliverance, and raising the dead. Brothers and sisters, when you and I start living for Jesus, wherever we are, maybe you are the CEO of a company, you're employed somewhere. You're a teacher. You're a housewife. You're a, you're a, uh, uh, what, what can I say? Okay, you're a student. 
in some in some place in a factory you will be doing the work of jesus you'll be healing you'll be delivering you'll be teaching you'll be your life itself will be a witness and every opportunity you get the holy spirit will push you to share the gospel and with power not just you know not just words there will be miracles and signs and wonders you will even raise the dead brothers and sisters don't limit the holy spirit's power in your life the works that you do will bear witness to the god you serve John 5:36 for the works which the father has granted me to accomplish these very works that i am doing bear witness to me that the father has sent me when you start doing the works of jesus in this world you don't have to say i am a christian i am a christian you will know your work will bear witness to who you are son and daughter of god heir of god joint heir with god with christ walking in power and authority in christ jesus so how do you activate the power of the holy spirit This is the last point. Keep acknowledging the presence of the Spirit in your life. Acknowledge the work of the Spirit. Acknowledge the power of the Spirit. See what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, and thank the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to acknowledge? Keep thanking the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Spirit of God, you're working in my life. Give Him the glory for the transformation He's bringing about in you. Keep loving the Holy Spirit. Keep on loving the Spirit. You can never love the Holy Spirit enough. Keep loving him. He first loved you. Immerse, immerse yourself in the love of God. He's the ocean of love. Stay immersed in His love. Consciously, consciously say, "Lord, I immerse myself in Your love." And when you immerse yourself, hurts will go, pain will go, bitterness will go. This is how you activate the power of the Spirit by an awareness that the Spirit is in you. And then what do you do? Start walking in the Spirit, brothers and sisters. whatever you do do in the power of the holy spirit drink of the spirit keep spending time exclusive time with the spirit drink of the spirit of god of his presence and live by the spirit let there be no other you know source of life for you let the holy spirit be your only source live by the spirit ephesians 6:18 says keep on praying in the spirit if you look at the life of saint paul he was all about the holy spirit all these expression walk by the spirit drink of the spirit live by the spirit everything you find in the letters of paul he was so enamored with the holy spirit he was all about the holy spirit holy spirit holy spirit i just keep on praying in the spirit because that's all that matters only the holy spirit matters and as you keep praying in tongues brothers and sisters all this will become a reality in your life i can see it happening in me why shouldn't it happen to you he was saying paul says again 1 corinthians 14 verse 5 it says now i wish that all of you spoke in tongues now i know more, most of you speak in tongues pray more in tongues pray more in tongues you will be the first and the greatest beneficiary apart from and as as you are edified others will benefit too but that's so important for you and as you communicate with the holy spirit on, in in tongues you are you know entering into a different realm you start looking at the world in different eyes different ears different kinds of ears because your spiritual eyes will be open your spiritual ears will be open and then the supernatural life will become normal to you. your faith and hope and love will be strengthened you will not give up you will not give in and nothing will be impossible for you brothers and sisters in conclusion be saturated with the spirit as you yield to the holy spirit and say holy spirit saturate me with your presence saturate me with your presence and it's not so much of receiving the holy spirit it's more of giving myself to the holy spirit because the whole fullness of the spirit is in us but we need to keep stirring up that presence for we are his workmanship and he can only work he can only recreate us continually as we surrender to him and do all the good works which god has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them and then you'll start living a life in the overflow of the spirit oh your life will be amazing it will be amazing then you realize hey this is what christianity is it's the best life ever god has the best for us brothers and sisters he's not coming into our life to take away to remove joy to remove peace he 
he's coming to fill us. So as you as you yield to the spirit, you'll experience life in its abundance. And that's our desire for you, brothers and sisters. So we just want to encourage you, invite you. Yes, there is so much as the Holy Spirit works in our life. Say yes. Say yes to the Holy Spirit. Invite the Spirit of God to take over your life. The Spirit is within you, but the Holy Spirit will not take over until you say yes. Don't close any part of your life to the Holy Spirit. Open every door and say, come in, Holy Spirit, come in. Take control. Take complete control. Roshan, you can stop the recording now. <laughs>